Um, I'm delighted with our panel. Um, it's, it is a very exciting group of people, and it's lovely to have a full range um, from the police, from St. Paul's Cathedral, City Hall, Theatre, and, and from Bynum's. It's, it's a very exciting grouping team. So, Tamden Allen from Bynum's, David Lamb from the Young Men's Theatre, Manira Mirza from City Hall, Giles, Canon Giles Fraser from St. Paul's Cathedral, and Chief Superintendent Peter Terry, welcome and thank you very, very much for coming. Um, we obviously understand that freedom of expression doesn't exist in a vacuum, and so what we want to do is to look at where the constraints come from and if they can help us understand how to reinforce artistic um, freedom of expression. Um, so our discussion today aims to explore the boundaries of challenging art in our global society. And um, David, I wanted to ask you, I mean obviously there's been censorship in the theatre, which obviously in the theatre forever, but how do you feel that um, our current society and our plural society has um, impacted on our attitudes towards controversy? Is there that relationship between the society as a plural society and controversy? Is there anything that um, is particular about that? I think one of the things we need to do is to look beyond the labels that we tend to use. And we talk about a plural society. Well, there have always been a plural society. It's not a new thing. And one of the ways of talking about a plural society is to talk about a city. Um, um, if you think about what is civilization, I and mean, the word civil serves, is civilization is something that happens in cities. And cities are places in which uh, contradictions abound. And it is one of the great pleasures of living in a city um, that one lives constantly with contradiction, with complexity, with ambiguity. Um, um, uh, and um, this is one of the ways in which uh, we discover who we are. If you think of, uh, I mean, it's not practical in, uh, to, to try and define art in a uh, discussion of this kind, but, but uh, basic line about art is it is people talking or writing about the things which matter most to them, um, expressing their deepest feelings, their deepest ideas, and in a complex society um, there will be disagreement and the uh, contradiction and complexity that that produces um, has to be welcomed, has to be protected. Thank you. Um, Peter, I wonder if you could Coming I mean, from a policing perspective, if, um, how would you say living in a plural society has influenced policing of controversial art? What I would first like to say is that I've dealt with this on many, many different levels, and I was the borough commander for Redbridge in East London. And I did that job for two and a half years. And for those of you who know Redbridge in East London, it is a fantastic and diverse borough. And it was a privilege to work there. As a borough commander and as the representative of 500 police officers who work in the area, you have to walk a very fine line to balance the needs of all communities. You're balancing the needs of people who live in £5 million houses against people and refugees who are coming into the borough who are packed in, and I use the word packed advisedly, packed in three or four families to a room living in the south end of the borough. And you walk a very, very difficult line. And whatever happens on that borough can impact on the cohesion of that borough. And to maintain people's tie into society, you've got to be very careful about where you take and what message you put across about what role of the police is. So I'm not overly convinced that the role of the police is around what goes on artistically. And, and what I'm not here to do, ladies and gentlemen, what I set out a clear steer was, I'm also not here to retrospectively judge decisions that have been made in other police forces or answer, answer for colleagues around the country. I can only put across what I think as the now head of profession for public order in the next and I think as the police service, the police service has got more and more difficult. More people have voices in the country now. More different groups. If you look at the schools in Redbridge, there are over 70 different languages spoken. There are people from other, well, from all the continents across the world represented in those schools. And whatever we as the police do is not to interfere with them, but we also have to be cognizant of people coming into the borough, people are part of that borough, insulting other groups in that borough, and how we tie ourselves from one group to another and now we strike an extremely fine balance. <clears throat> and, I mean, so when it comes to controversial art, how are you sort of 
well, those competing demands between sort of community cohesion and and sort of and then the right of the artist. And how would you how do you think your support for art is as as clear? As, and very rarely, and I'll be absolutely honest, and this is like Daniel walking into the lines. Very rarely. <laughs> One of the reasons I put my uniform on here today, and I, I had a discussion with you yesterday about that, is that I wanted people to be clear that I represent the police service. But the police service has to be one of neutrality. Do I see my job as to protect an art I'm not sure that I do. But do I see a job, my job as to uphold the law? Then yes, I do, absolutely. I took an oath when I joined the police service to do that. So in and of itself, I'm not sure I'm here to protect the artist. But when policing is engaged in art, <coughs> my job is to apply the law fairly, with integrity, within the bounds of the Human Rights Act, to ensure that individual can function. Now, what does that mean? Well, the police service are there for certain things. We're there to pr preserve the peace, we're there to protect life and property, and we're there to prevent crime and detect crime. That is our remit. Further than that, do I have any positive obligations around artists? I'm not convinced that in society the police service hold that role. But what responsibilities do the artists have? And what responsibilities do directors have? What responsibilities do theatre managers have in all of this? Because I think with rights, always come responsibilities. Thank you. Townsend, I just wanted to ask you um, about the, sort of the, the, the duty of the police to uphold freedom of expression. Well, the, the, um, the legal framework is obviously um, governed by the European Convention on Human Rights which promotes and protects freedom of expression. So where the question is um, the, uh, a pure freedom of expression issue, can this person express themselves or not, will this play be closed down, then I think the police do have a legal obligation under the Human Rights Act to positively help promote freedom of expression. Um, artistic freedom of expression, Ajit was talking about the politicalization of art, the participatory nature of audiences, and in his essay talked about um, the changing role of art in society, so challenge articulating a multicultural society. And so arguably, all artistic freedom of expression is becoming much more political. And certainly where an artistic event causes, if it was likely to cause religious offence, it's difficult to distinguish between political and artistic in a sensible way. And so the sort of protection that political freedom of expression has traditionally got from Europe ought in those circumstances be extended to artistic freedom of expression. Thank you. I mean I think that came through in the in the dealings with with, with the Coventry Police and the Coventry case study that there was a, a confusion if you like between um, how to police um, the, the, what was going on in the theatre and, and where they, they introduced this idea of actually charging for the policing and that's something that I think does, does indicate um, a lack of clarity, but I, mean, I know you're not going to comment on the particulars of, of that case. Um, Tamsin just, just alluded to that. I mean, arts are now widely accepted as being a tool for the promotion of social cohesion, social inclusion, empowerment, and mutual understanding between communities. Nira, I'd like to ask you how has national arts policy over the past 20 or 30 years influenced the setting? Thank you. 
makes you feel good about being part of this. And so you didn't have censorship in the old sense. You had a different kind of expectation of what the arts should be doing and the role that the arts play. And that brought in a different kind of regulation or concern about the impact that the arts can have and the concern that art that would be deemed uh, insensitive to the community or would not represent them properly in a way that they would want to see themselves uh, was a problem. And that, that arts policy has in some ways reflected that by the emphasis on cultural diversity, on tolerance, on respect, words which are well-intentioned, which none of us would say that we want to be disrespectful, we want to be intolerant, that those words become used as a way of saying this art is actually quite offensive to the community and therefore uh, we shouldn't put that on, or therefore maybe we want to rethink how we're going to present that. So I think a different kind of censorship has emerged in the last 20 or 30 years, which is not explicitly controlled by the state, but is almost internalised within the art sector. Uh, by uh, thinkers and writers and intellectuals. There is a culture where people think twice about what they say um, about a particular community. I think as it happens, um, people from those communities are less inhibited. So it's interesting that Gopri wrote about a community that she was part of and felt that she was entitled to do so. She didn't feel she was going to offend her fellow people. I'm not going to be speaking really that, sorry. But, um, but I think there's a greater fear on part of the establishment and of people outside the community to do that. Um, and the problem is not that arts policy is all powerful and it controls what artists say and do. I don't think the Arts Council uh, has that kind of influence. But I think in the context of uh, other incidents in society, the Salman Rushdie case and the fact that uh, politicians did come out and seemed very ambivalent about whether he should have the right to publish and whether um, it was right for... Um, uh, for, for the book to appear in Brussels, that that kind of uh, pronouncement by authorities has a real impact and it sends a message out to wider society that there are certain things which are too offensive uh, to be said publicly. And I think that's had a, a, a quite a substantial impact on the arts world, um, perhaps by stealth. You know, not, it's never been an explicit policy announcement or piece of legislation, although actually the incitement of religious hatred is part of that. But the arts world, I think, has taken that on board and at some level um, has become very nervous about saying things which are deemed offensive and controversial. Uh, <clears throat> this links very, very much to um, the comments that Kenan writes in the, in, the, in the opening essay and the case study. And I'm just quoting here, there has been an unstated assumption that while Britain is a diverse society, that diversity ends at the edges of minority communities. Um, and the idea being that suddenly they're homogenous which is, which is, I think, what you're saying as well, as much work on the play and sort of opens up the divisions in the community as well as um, the, the, the story that she, she wants to tell. But, Giles, could you, could you sort of talk for a moment about what, what is a community from your, from your point of view and who speaks for it? And are community attitudes a useful measure of what is and is not artistically acceptable? Well, I don't like the word community at all, actually. Because, um, I, I mean, implicit in your statement is, um, uh, you know, who is this and who do people speak for? Well, quite. Um, I think the problem with the word community is it's always some sort of absolute demand by someone on somebody else. Um, it's some sort of claim. Uh, and I'm suspicious of those sorts of claims being, I think it's a euphemism for all sorts of shifting things that we, we shove it into a pot. Um, and one of them is religion, uh, and one of them is about the sensitivities of religion and, and, and so forth. I mean, my reflection on a lot of this discussion is how similar it is to the discussion you might have uh, if this was a religious group of people on the flip side. That there's a sort of mimetic quality which is quite important <laughs> about these two things, and which is something about victimage, something about being pushed out of the public square, because religion itself feels pushed out of the public square in a way that's not unlike the sort of conversations you'd have here. And if I was in the, as it were, religious equivalent of this, with, as it were, religious people claiming for themselves some absolute right for an absolute <coughs> conversation and so forth, I would be saying, when you said thinking twice, which I thought was is rather important thinking twice. I mean, not you're allowed to say it, but thinking twice. Thinking twice is okay. Thinking twice is thinking. So I would want, if I was in a religious equivalent of this group, 
to say self-critical vigilance is a good thing. Absolute demands about oneself and one's rights are things to be, for me, anxious of in that setting. So then my, that, for me, translates into here. To what extent do you use words that are actually implicit absolute demands upon other people about what you can and cannot do? And it seems to me that living in a... I mean, I like... My, my great hero in politics is Isaiah Berlin, and Isaiah Berlin talks about living in a plural society where you have incommensurable values. And there's no way of putting this jigsaw together in such a way that, that really all fits. And I think that's right. So freedom, social order, all these different things actually are messily overlapping, which is why I think it's probably right that we all think twice. Yes. Whether judgments were made to charge the theatre or not to the policing, is not one I'm here to judge. My view is that when the core functions, the core principles of policing are engaged, then the police will engage in that. So if somebody is trying to use force, somebody is using threats of violence, somebody is breaching the peace to try and close down a piece of art, whether that be an exhibition, whether that be a play or something to that extent, the police have an absolute duty to police and to ensure that that legal performance goes on within boundaries about how many resources are available, what the impact on the great policing function is on that particular area or on the police force area, as has been held in previous judgments about live animal exports. However, if you get to the stage where a theatre is shown a play and the behaviour is not criminality and is not one that engages the police, the theatre has two choices. The theatre can employ its own security guards, it can employ its own in-house security, or they can contract the police to do that. If it doesn't reach the level that engages the police, then I think I go back to the responsibility of the theatre to manage itself. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you're sat in a theatre and a group of people do not want that play to go ahead, but they do not reach the level of criminality because they insist on having conversations quite loudly in that theatre, or they insist on getting their mobile phones out and ringing each other, the law isn't engaged in that because that is not criminality. Do we want police officers engaging in behaviour and dealing with people who are engaged in behaviour that doesn't constitute criminal behaviour? And that is where I would consider the right to charge special services of police would be engaged. Inside a theatre, when there isn't criminality and when the theatre can quite rightly deal with disruptive behaviour that doesn't reach the level of criminality. The, um, yeah. <laughs> I think that... Firstly, the decision to, um, by the time you decide that you need the police to be there, then you're already at the stage where you think there's a threat of criminal behaviour, through a protest or something which is threatening to the production. I don't think sort of, you know, eating crisps and making school kids making a noise is the sort of thing anyone would expect to call the police normally, unless it got to the level of a, of a sort of disturbance where there was a threat to, or, to order, in which case the core police function is engaged. But our difference is I think that core policing functions include the responsibility to promote freedom of expression, protect freedom of expression as a sort of fundamental lodestone of democracy, and that it's part of the police core functions. Um, the problem with the guidance for charging for events is that it makes absolutely no mention of artistic events at all. It's, it's concerned on the one hand with football matches, pop concerts and so on, on the other with um, charitable um, constitutional events like, you know, sort of, you know, royal wedding marches or political demonstrations and the dividing line for whether you can charge or not is whether or not it's a commercial event. Now that leaves out of the equation artistic events which can might be extremely important in challenging and articulating society um, to itself um, but are put on in a, in a commercial space and are part of a profit making enterprise. Now those under the current guidance would attract a charge. Of course it's negotiable course, different forces and different officers will speak to the theatre, and it may very well be that in, as in free to play, they decided in the end not to charge. But while there's that level of uncertainty, and there's a risk that you might end up paying £10,000 a day, if your play or your artistic event is likely to engender protest, then that makes the production uh, very, very challenging, and people are much less likely to find the space to express themselves without, the protect, without being able to guarantee and rely on um, protection where there's protest. Now, of course, the protesters may well be engaged in their right, right to freedom of thought and religion or freedom to protest. And so, of course, the protesters may also need police protection. 
this thing needs to be managed, and as you say, it is a difficult line. It does require very difficult judgments. You know, sometimes the law helps uh, uh, with making those judgments, sometimes it's just up to the police. But I think that the starting point has to be a balancing act between the value of artistic freedom of expression against the value of other protests without one being given greater value than the other. And I don't find myself disagreeing with you at all, but going back to the issue where criminality isn't engaged. I mean, I'll give you an example of last Monday and how difficult it is around policing. Last Monday we had Wen Jiabo, the Premier of China, in town. I was in charge of that policing operation. I had two groups of people stood outside down the street. One group supporting the presence of Wen Jiabo, the Free Tibet group, along with other groups who were opposed to the presence of Wen Jiabo. The two groups stood, I stood between them, the two groups will stand and shout and try and drown out each other's messages. My job isn't to ensure they get the message across. My job is to ensure there isn't a breach of the peace that arises from that. Uh, and it's that level of police engagement, and I think we will have to differ upon the point of whether the police have a responsibility to ensure freedom of speech per se, or whether the police have a responsibility to ensure policing doesn't impinge on free speech and enables free speech and positively enables free speech to take place when policing functions are engaged. And it's that level of engagement that we need to discuss. And again, what I've not heard here anywhere is the responsibility of the artist and the responsibility of the theatre to ensure that where it falls below the level of engagement of policing, who ensures that it does it? I, I just want to say a question to you, which is that it, in the example I gave in Birmingham of the one-day in advance, we will go in and do something about it. And obviously there are examples of non-artistic, of police breaking up young people, giving them a curfew. I mean, so the police do seem to have powers to, to, to intervene if they feel that they judge that there might be a public order issue. And that can affect artistic expression. Is that Can I just take other comments for a minute and guys? And then I would like to open up um, to the people on the subject. I think the suggestion of similar the issues are with regard to church and on one of the occasions, one of the parallels here, is I remember a while ago uh, I was preaching a sermon uh, 
in a, as it were, theatre, but my own theatre, as it were, and someone got up, and, uh, and someone got up uh, in the middle of this and said, you're talking fucking bollocks, Vicar, and then off he went in the middle of the sermon for about 15 minutes. He may or may not have been right, but the truth of the matter is, who's, who's, um, who, is that something you call in the police for? No, certainly not. Is that something that disrupts, as it were, my theatre? Well, it certainly does disrupt my theatre. Um, whose freedom of expression is being is being, you know, stomped on in that particular way, the person who's preaching or the person who's protesting or the it's a very complicated, very complicated thing. And of course just to make it all just to disrupt the whole thing, I was preaching in favour of homosexuality and the bloke was objecting, his objection was my, you know, unbiblical so it's very complicated who who um who actually gets to have the freedom in these particular and sucking the police into a situation like that. I think ask them to do something that's almost impossible to do. Uh, yes, Evan Harris, in response to what um, Peter and Munira said, I wanted to talk about the Human Rights Act, but Tamsin said everything, I was muttering here in the back row, but Tamsin said everything I, I uh, wanted to say or needed to be said. So I just want to ask Peter whether he accepts, Peter and Munira, whether he accepts that there is this positive duty uh, on the police to protect freedom of expression because they're bound by the Human Rights Act, which does deliver positive duties as a public authority, and indeed the mayor is a public authority and, and has the same positive duty. And I would have thought that both entities would realize this. And I, neither of you have said that you accept what Tamsin said on that score. And if you do, then that does mean that it's not just, well, it's, both sides are equal. As long as you protect the right to protest, you have to protect the right for that expression to take place. Um, or at least you have to show you've considered it. And I think in all the cases in the past, and I'm not expecting you, Peter, to comment on the past cases, but Beshti was a good example, there just wasn't that recognition. Um, so I would be grateful if you could clarify whether you accept you have this positive duty under the Human Rights Act. Um, well, I, I don't disagree with, the, with what Tamsin said. It's that the positive duty. My concern was just adding another piece of legislation where intervene when needed, but that they haven't, they haven't applied the law consistently. So I, I don't disagree that there is already that uh, mission in place for legal duty. For legal duty. I just wanted to, I, I just didn't think that we needed an additional. <laughs> the, the other do you want to come back to that? Uh, and again, I don't disagree that the police have a, a positive duty around extent that policing is engaged at that moment in time. There will be 10 or 12, because I've got the, uh, the sheet on, in my bag somewhere here and I'll bring it on the way across, there will be 10 or 12 different political demonstrations somewhere within central London and on the outskirts of central London taking place today. We are not engaged in that. We're not there to encourage that individual to, be, to have freedom of speech. Now if somebody wanted to go ahead and try and stop that individual from doing that and it was something that engaged the police in, I completely and utterly accept the police's responsibility is to be positive around that. But it's at what point in time do you engage the police in the positive promotion of freedom of speech? Uh, and that is where the difficulty lies. I cannot be, as the head of public order for the Metropolitan Police Service, engaged in every, every aspect and every part of freedom of expression. We can only deal with those matters that we are engaged in at that moment in time, or may become engaged in. Thank you. Can I take um, three? Uh, Manuel, Lloyd, and... Uh, uh, hello, my name is Glenn Williams. As an ex-police officer, uh, I, I hear what you're saying. And when I read this, I was wondering, how are you as a Chief Superintendent come, going to come here and explain how to police the art? Because I... I I was never aware that there was a positive duty towards um, uh, the police actually policing that area. But I think there is too much being expected of the police, one in terms of their capacity and ability to act in that area. And also I think we're getting out, we're, we're, we're moving into the realms of expecting the police to do something that they were never equipped for. 
and that is actually work outside that boundary of um, those boundaries in terms of law enforcement because that's what they're there for. But listening to this conversation has made me want you to ask you the question about you're talking in terms of policing in terms of the visual, public order. But we all know that actually policing goes into the secretive area because the argument that you've put forward, I would like to say, well, how does that work under the prevent strategy where we're now talking about extremism in terms of that possibly becoming a criminal offence if there is some suspicion that it actually relates to supporting Al-Qaeda or those views? Because then the police will become very active in policing what goes off there. So the police is active in that particular area and it's not as clear cut as, as you've made out. And if I'm wrong, please tell me I'm wrong. Uh, can I take um, Sorry, I'm going to finish up. Uh, Lloyd Eason, Theatre. We've just interviewed, we're doing a production for the National Theatre here on uh, Islam, free speech and multiculturalism. And we interviewed David Henshaw from Hardcash Productions. I'm sure people might be aware that he did a program called Undercover Mosques. What was interesting is that the West Midlands Police and the Crown Prosecution Service tried to discredit that program, despite the fact that the program had evidence that was on the recordings. They tried to discredit them by saying that they had um, edited the program in a misleading way. And um, they called a press conference, they tried to ambush David Henshaw, and in the end, what happened is that they took it to court because their reputation had been soiled and they won £100,000 damages. So here is a very clear example where the police have intervened, and I'm not pretending to pick on the police, but it's just an example of where actually the police have come in and been very proactive in trying to censor an arts documentary program. And that, for me, is a very worrying sign. Roland Cummings. Um, Someone mentioned the controversy over um, Upper North, which I think is um, an interesting case. I don't know what all the facts of it, but having looked at some of the responses um, uh, yesterday, the assumption does seem to be that Upper North has caved in to, to homophobic prejudice. So they've withdrawn this offer that deals with um, um, homosexuality and the bullying of a, of a, gay, a gay teacher, I think. Um, but it's notable, I think, that it seems that like, the initial concerns coming from the, the, the schools and the families were to do with insulting language, in fact. Um, rather than simply the fact that it was a gay character. Um, and I think given some of the anxiety about homophobic bullying in schools, you can see perhaps a temptation for people just to steer clear of the issue, not because of prejudice against, um, against gay people, but because they think it might encourage kids to behave um, childishly as, as they do. Um, and it's, you know, there's always been difficulty distinguishing between gay, uh, children using gay as an insult and the actual persecution of, of gay teenagers. It seems that we have a difficulty making that um, distinction in terms of um, understanding how it operates in schools. So it just seems to me there's a level of self-policing there, um, a temptation to stay away from anything controversial, which isn't straightforwardly about the bad um, bigots over here and the creative um, liberal arts types here, um, but actually that people, for well-intentioned reasons, um, can, can fight shy of these kinds of issues. And that, that's why I, I would be concerned about the idea of thinking twice of thinking like a policeman. I mean, we pay the police to think like policemen. And um, I think that's something that artists um, shouldn't necessarily take, take on themselves. Um, also, I just think we should be wary of seeing the problem always as coming from out there. Um, I think there is a, a, a degree of cautiousness um, about dealing with certain issues, using certain, certain language and so on. Of course, we should be polite and, uh, uh, and, and respectful, but I think sometimes that does lead into self-policing, um, and that's actually more problematic.
that, that you know something might happen, the kind of the, the, the culture of caution, um, which can exist in institutions, not in all institutions, but that does happen. <coughs> I don't recognise that. I mean, I can understand the logical conclusion that is likely to be the case, but I don't recognise that. And sadly, I need to go into your question of what the responsibility of the theatre is for the art of language. I think our responsibility is to create the circumstances in which artists can speak and find their audience. Excuse me. And that do you have a microphone, please? You can oh, step out here. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I guess what I'm saying is I think that um, the responsibility is, well, I run the theatre. My responsibility is to create circumstances in which as many artists as I'm able to give um, space and time to can find their audience. And that, that is my responsibility. Um, I mean, I can be criticised in, um, <coughs> perhaps, in the uh, range of people that I give that opportunity to, and um, I see my responsibility as trying to give as wider range as I can, um, but the job is to, is to let the artists find their audience. Thank you. Um, Hadi, and then um, Lisa, and Rod, and then the next three. I think one of the, one of the com comments that were made in the press in 2005 by a very preeminent figure in the artistic community, um, sorry to use that word again, but uh, the, the word he used after the Beersley debacle was that Sikhs have shown themselves to be philistine. So there you've got somebody that's painted a whole community uh, as philistine as a consequence of the actions of a handful of Sikh born lager louts who decided to smash a few windows. Um, I personally drink Ribena. Um, <laughs> so the, I guess the point, the point that I make is that uh, there's a frustration for faith-based practitioners, be it Sikh, be it Christian, be it Jews, that actually the true values of their doctrine is not recognised by the media, nor do they care. Um, and the values that Sikhism have had is egalitarianism, equality, freedom of expression. Um, we even had a guru who died for the freedom of expression of the Hindu faith, who decided to be decapitated. Um, so none of these actually come out in the press, and it's quite frustrating. And I think it's incumbent on you know, the, the, the religious uh, practitioners, as well as artistic uh, directors and theatres, to actually celebrate some of those values, internal and external, that uh, religious people have to offer. Um, I just wanted to... Uh, <laughs> David, David, I didn't say it's something that he doesn't recognise uh, censorship within arts organisations, self-censorship of the institutions. Um, I, I recognise it only too well, and I think, you know, during the whole process of the hub, there was a huge amount of um, censorship going on um, within the theatre that I was working for, and ostensibly running, or I wasn't really. Um, and I think that, um, I suppose, to me, uh, if I'm honest, what came out of that experience for me was that actually... Um, freedom of expression uh, should fear the artistic institution in a sense, um, you know, that, 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 that that's actually where the biggest problem lies because there's this kind of interdependency between the institution on the one hand and then um, this sort of disallowed <coughs> defense on, on, on the other. And both of those uh, aspects actually um, work against the, the, the sort of progressive desire of the artist and, and I think the ways that just uh, the ways that you know we saw it during the HUD and of course as Doug Briggs rightly said you know the work was protected and that was an achievement and all the rest of it but I think that the conditions uh, still exist ideologically you know morally whatever uh, for another Beshti to happen tomorrow I don't think anything's actually really moved forward apart from a, a better understanding of kind of risk assessment and how to actually piece a piece of work in a sense um, you know, uh, from the reading of Beshti that we were, we were trying to put on, that, you know, the chair of my board tried to stop, the executive director tried to stop, you know, uh, and this, I don't think that was out of any sort of malice, <laughs> that was out of fear, and, and a certain, what, I, what I would say is a certain cowardice and a certain hypocrisy, but I think it's absolutely right. In my experience of the arts, it's absolutely right, and people don't want to talk about it because everybody wants to believe that we're all in favour of freedom of expression, and we're all on the same page, and we're not by any means at all. And I think the way it came out 
Just, just to pick up on the points and actually move it back to the to the case study that we're discussing. Um, quite a lot of the time when we have the discussions of free expression in this uh, lecture theatre, I've, I've got an urge to stand up and shout, there's a fire in this crowded theatre. Um, and the, the 21st century way of doing that is to compose a mischievous tweet. So the one I, the mischievous tweet uh, that I've been uh, composing, I'm just about to hit send on, is... Uh, the, the Young Vic and the South Bank Centre announce a new production of Beshti, which has the full support of the Metropolitan Police and the Mayor of London, um, who else is on the panel. Uh, it will be performed at St Paul's Cathedral. Um, and Tam's in, so you're not left out, you'll be playing the lead. Um, now, there's two reasons why I can't actually send that to you, or three, because my director's sort of glaring at me. Um, <laughs> The, the, the second is that it's more than 140 characters. Um, the third, it's, it's not true yet. Um, why can't it be true? Why can't I send that tweet? <laughs> we, could, we could do sort it out now, can't we? responsibility as not just a theatre director but a, a citizen of this country is actually broader than simply that. We all have broad and overlapping responsibilities. Simply define your responsibility in those narrow terms. The only person I know who defines their responsibility their responsibility simply in terms of what I want to say uh, is my teenage daughter who would see no other responsibilities in the world apart from I have to say it because I have to say it. Now, all I'm calling for is an acknowledgement that there is overlapping responsibilities and that this is a, that's a sort of responsibility in all sorts of ways, which is that we have to negotiate in this grey area. And that's the, that's the sort of reality of living in a complex society. Well, I'm very aware of time. Um, can we just take a final comment, I'm afraid, from the, from the, from the panel this time? Um, but there are, there are breakout sessions, so hopefully the points you want to make can feed into the sort of jet speaking process. I just want to come back on that and also what was being said about the role of policing on cover operations and the sort of obligations um, to go back to the legal framework which we all operate under and which governs state um, responses to freedom of expression including the police and other state authorities which is that freedom of expression is not an unqualified right it's a qualified right it carries with it the exercise of these freedoms that is the freedom of expression carries with it duties and responsibilities and as a result of that it's subject to conditions restrictions or penalties as are prescribed by law and are necessary in a democratic society. And then it gives a list of reasons why they might be necessary, including the prevention of crime and disorder, the protection of morals, and so on. So there is, for those who are grappling with these sorts of issues, particular state bodies, there is a framework for this body of case law, which is get concerned with balancing the right itself and then the qualifications to that right on the other hand. So there is guidance in the framework we have. Um, well, on that bombshell, um, I'm just going to turn to sorry. Um, it's a fascinating discussion, and I have a strong feeling that there's a great deal more in the room that needs to be said. And the interesting thing is how we can sort of construct that next conversation. And I hope that there will be that next conversation. And I think there's, you know, obviously from what everybody's been saying, both from Flora and from the, from the, from the, the panel, there's, there's a huge amount of interesting subjects. Um, so thank you. Very
very much indeed to the panel um, for, for a really exciting discussion. Thank you for your contribution, and may they continue into the breakout. We're now going to have a short break for coffee, um, but it, it, we can't linger too much, unfortunately, because we do want to give good time to the breakout session. I hope you know which breakout we're going to, and um, the